On the campus of Stanford University, the world's largest linear electron accelerator is taking shape. Essentially an electron microscope two miles long, it will permit man's most refined exploration of the atomic nucleus. This is a project of massive proportions and unprecedented accuracies. Two and a half million cubic yards of earth have been moved. 130,000 cubic yards of concrete have been poured. 10,000 tons of steel bars are reinforcing the two mile long structure, which will contain the basic component of the accelerator, a tube of pure copper, four inches in diameter, 10,000 feet long, and straight to within the thickness of a dime. This unique complex accelerator structure is composed of 240 modular units, each 40 feet long, and their fabrication entails some of the most advanced processes ever developed. The basic segment or module consists of a 40 foot aluminum pipe or girder on which are mounted four aluminum support brackets called strongbacks. Each strongback supports a 10-foot section of copper accelerator pipe or disc-loaded waveguide, whose function is to guide the microwaves of energy which accelerate the electrons. Other parts of the module include the copper rectangular waveguides, which carry the energy from its source, the klystron tube, to the disc-loaded waveguide and the small copper pipes of the cooling system. Literally hundreds of vendors from more than a dozen states supply the materials and equipment necessary to fabricate the modules at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. The most sophisticated component of the module is the disc-loaded waveguide. It is constructed from 84 cylinders, approximately four inches in diameter and one inch long. 85 discs, approximately four inches in diameter, with a hole about three quarters of an inch in diameter in the center, two offset coupler cavities and two end plates. These parts are brazed together to form a 10 foot section of disc loaded waveguide containing 86 cavities. Its interior structure, manufactured to extremely small tolerances, enables high power RF energy fed into the waveguide to accelerate electrons passing along the 10,000 foot length through the holes in the center of the discs. At each end of the 10 foot section is a separately brazed sub-assembly known as a coupler. These couplers not only couple together the 10 foot sections, they also have an opening or window to allow the bursts of energy to enter the waveguide at the beginning of each 10-foot section and depart it at the end of each section. Each 10-foot section functions as an independent unit in accelerating the electrons passing through it. Waveguides are conductors of electricity and must be made of highly conductive material. Nearly two million pounds of refined copper is being processed to eliminate virtually all impurities. This oxygen-free, high-conductivity copper is then formed into flat bar a quarter of an inch thick, extruded pipe four inches in diameter, and other extruded pieces to form the rectangular waveguide and cooling systems. Fabrication takes place at the Stanford Linear Accelerator site. It begins with the rough finishing of copper cylinders and discs, which will make up the disc-loaded waveguide. Ten foot lengths of extruded round copper pipe are cut into cylinders approximately one and a quarter inches long. They are checked for rough length and deburred prior to machining. The cylinders are then rough machined to within 10 thousandths of an inch of their final dimensions on all surfaces.
Discs are machined from 10 foot lengths of flat copper bar. The copper must be handled with great care, even at this stage, to prevent the contamination of its surface by foreign impurities. The disc is deburred and the inside diameter is rough machined. Each of the 85 discs in the finished 10 foot section will have a hole of a slightly different diameter. Rough machining supplies nine different hole sizes. Fine machining transforms these to 85 different hole sizes. Now the cylinders and discs must be annealed to verify the quality of the copper and to relieve them of stresses so that they will remain dimensionally stable. They are chemically cleaned, then stacked on a fixture which separates them during the annealing process in the furnace. The fixture is fastened to the lid of a retort. The body of the retort is the can into which they descend. After fastening the lid to the body, the retort is raised by crane and transported down the aisle of the assembly bay. It is about 16 feet high and weighs about 1,100 pounds when loaded. The retort is transferred to a monorail for the trip to the furnace building. After the retort is lowered into a storage hole, it is purged, first with nitrogen to remove all oxygen, then with hydrogen. The copper is annealed in an atmosphere of pure hydrogen to prevent oxidation. Since a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen is very explosive, great care must be taken to remove all of the oxygen. A probe connects the retort with a gas analyzer. If an explosive mixture is detected, the alarm system allows corrective action. A safe indication permits the lighting of the hydrogen vent. The purge is now complete and the retort may be transferred into the furnace. The furnace consists of a circular brick-lined well with nichrome heating elements operating in air. It is powered by 300 kilowatts of electricity and is capable of temperatures up to 1100 degrees centigrade. During annealing, the parts are taken up to 1,030 degrees centigrade and held for 40 minutes. Both annealing and brazing are done in this furnace. The retort is moved over the furnace by crane and lowered into the opening. The 30 rows of heating elements can be controlled independently in groups of three to ensure uniform temperatures. Thermocouple leads are connected. Temperatures at 24 locations inside the retort are indicated. The doors form a heat shield as well as a safety barrier. During brazing, the vented hydrogen continues to burn. Temperatures at the 24 thermocouples are recorded. It takes about 50 minutes to heat the 550 pounds of copper to 1,030 degrees centigrade. When all of the thermocouples read the same, the coils are carefully controlled to maintain that temperature for 40 minutes. Position one, position two, position three, position four, five, six, 
seven, eight, 40 minutes at 1,030 degrees centigrade in a hydrogen atmosphere. The process is now complete. Protective headgear is worn to prevent ear damage in case the hot retort should explode during removal from the furnace. After annealing, the parts are removed from the retort and placed in baskets. They are now ready for finish machining. Even in the rough stage, the cylinders are numbered. Like the discs, each of the cylinders in the 10-foot length will be a different size. They have been rough finished into seven sizes. Finish machining of the cylinders is accomplished on a two-spindle boring machine. The rough cylinders are first put on the right spindle, where the outside diameter is machined. Then straddling tools come in to cut the desired width. When transferred to the left spindle, the inside diameter is cut. After machining, the part is checked to verify size. It is then deburred and the edges are blended in. Although this operation appears to be a coarse one, it only removes about one millionth of an inch. The part is now degreased from this point on, it must not be touched by bare hands. A fingerprint would deposit enough acid to etch the finely finished copper, making it unacceptable. In quality control, the cylinder is critically measured for size with air gauges, which indicate to within 20 millionths of an inch. They operate by measuring the amount of air escaping between the various dimensions of the cylinders and the close-fitting fixtures holding the air jets. The inside and outside diameters, wall thickness and height are measured by successive gauges. A profilometer checks the surface finish of both inside and outside diameters, which must be less than 16 millionths of an inch in roughness, nearly as smooth as glass. Each part is now numbered according to its final position in the 10-foot section. This is cylinder number 68 of a total of 84 cylinders. For economy reasons, 36 parts of each size are produced in a run. The finished machining of the discs starts with a bang. The copper is straightened to ensure flatness. Machining is done on a two-spindle cam-operated boring machine. After surface facing and turning the outside diameter, the inside diameter is cut and its edge radius to tolerances within two ten thousandths of an inch. With the oil coolant turned off, the action of the bit can be seen more easily. The tools move in and out automatically, placing the curve first on the outer, then on the inner edge. The movement of these tools is governed by cams, which have been specially ground to generate the desired dimensions of the disc. the oil coolant is controlled to within a quarter of a degree to ensure a temperature stabilized part during machining. The completed disc is now checked in quality control. The radius is first checked by the height of the ball. The diameters are checked as well as thickness, parallel and flatness. The gauge numbers indicate tenths of a thousandth of an inch 
and the outside diameter and thickness of the disc must be within two tenths of a thousand. The concentricity of the hole is measured with respect to the outside diameter. The full contour of the radius is measured. Each disc is also numbered according to its position in the 10-foot section. Discs and cylinders are cleaned, then wrapped in plastic and put in storage. Because the parts are machined in groups of 36, approximately 6,500 parts must be made before the 10-foot sections of the disc-loaded waveguide can be assembled. Since the quality of the copper must be extremely high, its purity must be carefully checked. In the metallurgical laboratory, oxygen analyzing equipment determines the amount of oxygen in the copper. Copper specimens are cast in plastic, ground, and polished for micro-examination. Copper crystals before annealing are relatively small. Annealing enlarges them, making it easier to check for impurities. The hardness of copper samples is checked. A part which will form the strong back is carefully measured. Electronic readout shows dimensions to accuracies of one half of a thousandth of an inch. An optical comparator checks the dimensions of parts such as the rectangular waveguide flange. This specially developed flange couples the disc-loaded waveguide to the rectangular waveguide. It uses an all-metal gasket and allows the rectangular waveguide feed system to be evacuated to 10 to the minus 8th inches of mercury and at the same time pass 20 million watts peak power. On the optical comparator, the vacuum sealing grooves are checked for diameter and configuration. The 10-foot section is not assembled in one operation. First, two sub-assemblies are made, an input coupler with six cylinders, seven discs, an offset cavity, and an end plate, and an output coupler with five cylinders, six discs, an offset cavity, and an end plate. The coupler is stacked in a granite V-block to ensure straightness. A shim of gold copper brazing alloy is placed between each part. These shims will melt at about 1,015 degrees centigrade, brazing the parts together into a single unit. which terminates each 10-foot length, is thicker than the discs to provide the isolation necessary to keep the microwave energy from going from one section to the next. A clamp is placed over the unit to keep it straight. A stainless steel plate serves as the end clamp, and the spring keeps the unit under tension during the time it is brazed. The unit is checked for straightness before being moved to the small brazing furnace. An alloy flag is tied on as a temperature check. Two units are brazed at one time. Connection flanges, which are welded together to connect the 10-foot sections on the girder assembly, are placed on with alloy to braze them to the coupler. Care must be taken to make sure the alloy does not run onto the surface of the flange and interfere with welding. The lid of the inner retort is put into place as well as the lid of the outer retort. This is a hydrogen atmosphere furnace, much like the one seen before. The parts are viewed through a window. The temperature is raised to about 1,010 degrees centigrade. 
at which the alloy shim, one thousandth of an inch thick, begins to melt. The alloy flag on the right of the back coupler is melting, an indication that the brazing has started. The temperature will be raised to 1,030 degrees centigrade for complete brazing. After brazing, the coupler is placed in a contour milling machine and the window or coupling iris is cut for the rectangular waveguide coupling connection. The dimensions of this hole through which the energy will either enter or leave the 10-foot section must be accurate to within 5 10 thousandths of an inch. The tool follows a precision-made template to attain this accuracy. The rectangular waveguide connection is then brazed onto the coupler. Before assembly, as well as before annealing, all parts are chemically cleaned. The cylinders and discs, which are to form the 10-foot section, are taken through a cycle of 12 chemical and water baths to free them from oxides, oil, and other contaminants. Emulsion cleaner, water rinse, alkaline cleaner, water rinse, bright dip, water rinse. The parts are worked back and forth to make sure the chemicals reach those areas in contact with the carrying baskets. Water rinse, 50% hydrochloric acid, water rinse, cyanide dip, water rinse. This cleaning cycle is representative of that used for all waveguide parts. All of the copper parts for a 10-foot section or up to 500 feet of rectangular waveguide can be cleaned at one time. The final rinse is high purity, high temperature distilled water. The excess is blown off with dry nitrogen to avoid contamination. The parts are then placed in a hot air oven to dry at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for five minutes. The finished cleaned parts are now ready to be stacked into a 10-foot length of disc-loaded waveguide. In the pressurized ultra-clean stacking room, an input coupler is placed at the base of the granite V-block. After alignment, cylinders and discs are stacked above the coupler in numerical order. A shim of silver-copper brazing alloy one thousandth of an inch thick is placed between each part. This alloy will melt at approximately 783 degrees centigrade, brazing the individual parts into a 10-foot unit. 73 cylinders, 72 discs, stacked on a granite V-block which has been ground to an accuracy of less than one thousandth of an inch in 10 feet. Cylinder 8, alloy, disc 8. The slightest bump will ruin the parts at this stage. Cylinder 28, alloy, disc 28. One after the other, the 145 parts are stacked with the utmost care so that the hole in the center of the discs through which the electron beam will pass is straight to within ten thousandth of an inch. The output coupler is now put into place and aligned. The section is carefully checked for numerical sequence and to be certain there is alloy between each part. The section is finally clamped to await brazing. The V-block is tilted hydraulically to the vertical position. 
A mandrel is lowered from its storage capsule in the ceiling down through the holes in the discs. The mandrel clamps the assembly together, holding it in place during the brazing operation. The top of the mandrel is hooked to the arm of the transfer boom, and the assembly is moved to the specially designed vertical flame furnace. The mandrel is connected at the top to a vertical tube which supports the section. The tube also feeds a mixture of 90% nitrogen and 10% hydrogen into the hollow mandrel, where it passes through holes in the sides of the mandrel into the 10-foot section during brazing. The section hangs as a free plumb bob, and a water baffle is connected at the bottom to stabilize it. The furnace consists of a yellow can, which provides a protective atmosphere in which the pipe will cool after it is brazed and a ring burner, which contains the gas jets for brazing. Both move vertically and independently by means of lead screws. The protective can and ring burner are moved to the top of the assembly before ignition. The braze is made by actuating both sets of lead screws simultaneously so that the protective can and the ignited ring burner move down the pipe together. The pipe is brazed in air. It is protected from oxidation by virtue of a reducing flame of hydrogen and oxygen. The flame is hydrogen rich, the hydrogen being far more abundant than oxygen, preventing oxidation. Immediately after the braze, the pipe goes through the nose of the can and cools in the protective atmosphere. The liquid dripping from the ring burner is condensation, a byproduct of combustion between the hydrogen and oxygen. As the flame progresses down the pipe, there is no significant evidence of oxidation below the burner and absolutely none above the burner. Careful observation of the joint approached by the flame will show the melting of the alloy as the braze takes place. This furnace allows precise control of the brazing alloy inside the pipe. Heating is so rapid that a temperature differential can actually be maintained across the 3 8 inch wall thickness. The amount of alloy that goes inside the assembly is controlled by the rate of heating. It is possible to make brazes with only a pencil line width of alloy at the joint inside the structure. It is not desirable to have alloy inside the pipe since it has a lower RF conductivity than the copper and produces undesirable energy losses. Another advantage of this method of brazing is the extremely short period of time that each joint is at the melting point, enhancing dimensional stability. It takes about 40 minutes to braze the 200 pounds of copper. As the burner reaches the lower coupler, the ring jets are turned off and any remaining flame caused by gas flowing from the cooling can is extinguished in no uncertain terms. Immediately after brazing, the sequence of the cylinders and discs is checked as well as the quality of the braze. The section is evacuated and leak checked by flowing helium first around the couplers then under a plastic bag covering the section. If there is a leak, helium will enter the waveguide and be detected by a mass spectrometer. The section is borescoped. Each of the 86 cavities is visually checked for imperfections and cleanliness. The pipe is now transferred to the water jacket assembly area. There has been a time lapse since brazing, so the surface is cleaned with ether. Thermocouple holes are drilled using acetone as a lubricant to keep the section oil free. Strips of alloy have been previously spot welded to the cooling tubes. The tubes have been bent into a hairpin shape and clamped together in support rings. Two five foot sections of tubing are clamped together to form one half of the system two other sections form the other half. They are connected with nickel-plated copper tees and held together by tie wires. 
temporary hose clamps hold the assembly, while stainless steel tie wires are placed and tightened. They hold the assembly and alloy against the pipe during brazing. Additional holes are drilled for thermocouple wires, which are inserted with alloy and will be brazed into the pipe at the same time the water jacket is brazed. To enhance temperature uniformity in operation, sheets of stainless steel are placed under the nickel-plated tees to prevent them from being brazed to the pipe. Feed tubes are installed, as are the inlet and outlet manifold blocks. The tubes are gently crimped to hold them in place. The tie wires are double-checked and tightened. The entire unit is carefully examined, and the assembly is ready to be brazed. Retort thermocouple wires are attached over the length of the structure. It is finally lowered into the retort can to await brazing. After brazing, the tie wires are removed. More than 200,000 tie wires will be required for the two miles of disc-loaded waveguide. The section is now installed on the aluminum strongback. The copper disc-loaded waveguide is so soft that it will not hold itself in alignment without a supporting mechanism. The pipe is clamped at four places and precisely aligned to its required straightness. The section is now moved to the RF tuning room to be tuned. The diameter of each of the cavities must be made to an equivalent accuracy after tuning of 50 millionths of an inch if the accelerator is to function properly. Since this order of accuracy is well beyond that economically feasible in machining, each cavity is constructed slightly larger than required and is compressed to the desired dimension. In the tuning room, the pipe is installed in a machine which makes the necessary microwave measurements and compresses the cavities. The top coupler is attached to a source of low power microwave energy, a clamp precisely aligns the flanges. A vacuum system is connected to evacuate the waveguide. Distilled water is fed through the cooling system to maintain the pipe at the desired operating temperature of 113 degrees Fahrenheit. The cavities of the couplers have already been tuned by hand. Reference adjustments are made. The meter shows the difference in phase angle between what the cavity has and what it should have. Once the meter has been adjusted relative to the hand-tuned cavities, the remaining cavities can be tuned to the phase reference points. A carriage with four plungers shifts to the first untuned cavity. A shorting rod on the inside of the waveguide is positioned by stainless steel bands connected to the carriage. This rod allows the phase measurement of the cavities above the short. The tuning plungers are brought to the pipe. As pressure is exerted on the plungers, they push into the copper, compressing the cavity. The phase meter shows the correcting phase differential. The cavity is slightly over squeezed, then released. The copper springs back to within the specified tolerance of two and a half degrees. The carriage shifts to the next cavity. The plungers are brought in. Pressure is applied. The phase meter indicates the amount of correction. The pressure is released. And the cavity springs back to the desired size. And so on, until all of the cavities have been tuned. The machine is now switched to automatic and with the plungers removed, the phase angle of each cavity is automatically checked and plotted. This is an extremely critical operation. To make absolutely sure it has been done correctly, the pipe is transferred to the other side of the room and rechecked on another machine by another operator. The 10-foot section is borescoped to ensure that it is free from any foreign particles. The tuned waveguide is now subjected to high power radio frequency testing in which it is connected to the full power of a klystron tube. The waveguide is lowered into a concrete pit to isolate any spurious X-ray type radiation during initial processing. As the pipe is processed, this radiation diminishes. 
The flange on the input coupler is connected to the rectangular waveguide, which brings the energy from the klystron. Wires are connected to the thermocouples to measure the temperature during the test. The temperature must remain constant to within one and a half degrees over the 10 foot length. Liquid nitrogen and a mechanical vacuum pump are used to obtain rough vacuum. The chamber lid is rolled into place. The lead cased klystron is turned on and the test begins. This is a measurement of the phase shift and attenuation as a function of the input power level. The oscilloscope shows klystron beam voltage and RF input, output, and reflected power. The temperature at 16 locations is measured, plus that of the water entering and leaving the cooling system. Power is indicated and continuously recorded on a graph are input, output, and reflected power. Input, output, and pump out vacuum. Phase readout and input water temperature. When the test is over, the waveguide is filled with nitrogen at five pounds of pressure and sealed. The cooling system is purged with alcohol to remove all water, and the section is ready to be assembled onto the 40-foot girder. As was shown at the beginning of the film, the completed 40-foot module consists not only of the disc-loaded waveguide, but also of the rectangular waveguide, which carries the power from the klystron to the 10-foot sections. The rectangular waveguide arrives at the fabrication building and must be processed into units, some of which are approximately 38 feet long. First, the waveguide is cut to precision lengths. The ends are milled into male and female joints for assembly. Some sections of the rectangular waveguide bend to change the orientation from vertical to horizontal. Straight pieces must be given this bend without changing their inside dimensions. A special machine clamps the waveguide and bends it, while a flexible mandrel is retracted through the curve, keeping the inside dimensions constant. The interior is not scored, and the only alteration is the change in thickness of the inside and outside walls. Since the length of the rectangular waveguide must be constant, a cooling system is required. Cooling tubes are brazed in an operation similar to the brazing of the water jacket to the disc-loaded waveguide. Stainless steel clamps and tie wires hold the alloy against the waveguide. Other short sections are brazed to the stainless steel flanges, which will connect the rectangular waveguide to the assemblies in the accelerator housing and the klystron gallery. All of the various lengths of rectangular waveguide are brought together on the horizontal brazing table. The mobile brazing unit, similar to the vertical flame furnace, brazes each joint individually. Care must be taken to completely braze the joints, yet not get excessive alloy inside the waveguide. Now all components are ready for the final assembly into a 40-foot module. The 40-foot aluminum girder has been delivered from the vendors. After a thorough inspection, the four 10-foot sections of disc-loaded waveguide are placed in position, aligned, and secured. Thank you.
the elements of the vacuum system are attached and welded. Finally, the rectangular waveguide is attached. Fabrication of one 40-foot module is complete. There are only 239 to go.